Jessica DeMassa, and I'm here at the Heise Studio here at HIC 2017. I'm here with Matu. Uh, can you please introduce yourself for everybody watching? Sure. So my name's Matu Bush, and I am a human-centered designer. I'm also a clinician, and I'm doing an innovation residency where I hang out at the front line. I actually call it an empathy residency, really. I'm just there to empathize with you, and when I empathize with you in a deep way, I get the best insights. So I'm not going to develop something that you're never going to use because I've empathized with you. So for me, it's a really smart way for businesses to stop wasting time. And just a, such a small example is our nurses don't use their phones, so it is no use developing apps for them. And I wouldn't have known that if I didn't hang out with them at the front line and empathize with the equipment that they use. So that's what I do. Okay, so that's fantastic. You're almost like a healthcare anthropologist yeah, here. Very yes. Much so. Okay, so talk to me a little bit about how other organizations can adopt some of the, I don't know, some of the tricks that you're using to kind of empathize with people. How, how do we do this? How do we incorporate this and learn? Great. I think, first of all, just don't embrace a methodology. If you embrace a methodology too much, then it's about the artifacts of the methodology become your endpoints. Okay. That any methodology you use, human centered design, user experience, is just part of the process, focus on the relationship. And all the artifacts of how you do the business and how you do it, that's all secondary to that relationship. So, um, one of the easy ways to do is free up people's time in your organization to just go and hang out at the front line and really hang out and uh, get in the car, travel with the nurse. Okay and just live their day and then you will get insights so just free up somebody's time to do that and the more senior you are try and do that at least once a month go and work go and wash patients just get out there get your hands dirty yeah. get the hell out of the office and the bloody emails and everything else just mm -hmm. go and experience it because then you've got more clout and more authority to talk about what happens because when you go into meetings often people are talking about work imagined oh this is how it happens well no it doesn't <laughs> No, it doesn't. And then you make decisions on what you think happens, which is not reality, and then you end up blaming staff, saying they're, not, they're change resistant. Right. They're never change resistant. It's just that you never went to, ha gave the, the courtesy to find out what was happening at the front line. Yeah, you're changing the wrong thing. Yeah. What's interesting here is that you're bringing this approach to a data conference. Yeah. And so typically people think about data as numbers, right? They think about all of the big numbers that are being crunched yeah. and the deep learning AI that's going to make sense and, and figure out, you know, the, uh, the analytics on it and analyze and give us these great insights. But you're advocating more for the qualitative data. And how do we take those insights, I guess, and marry the two yeah. so that we have a really smart set of data? What's your advice there? So for me, data is, uh, uh, there's a story behind data. Um, there's a narrative behind data. Um, the best data in the world uh, will die if the, the organisation's a really poor culture. So patient stories, human stories, the more those stories that a culture values and shares, if you've got the right story, which is all about the individual at the end, I find bringing this type of conversation to data coders, it inspires them. People want work with meaning. And if you can give them that meaning, and, and when I, I do a lot of photography of, of uh, clients and, and people who are disadvantaged, and I tell their stories, I say, this is Mitch, this is Vera, she's 101, we're the only people that visit her. And that can help motivate people to do a great job, because people are in healthcare because something's in their DNA, they want to make the world a better place. And inspiration comes when, you go, when we can give them a story that says, what you do can result in this individual having a, a great experience. But if you can do it for one, then you can do it for 10. You can do it for 10, you can do it for 1,000. And then if you're talking much, much bigger, then you're affecting the lives and, uh, of so many people in Victoria or wherever you're working. Now that's a legacy people want to leave. Mm -hmm. Without mm -hmm. a doubt. And talk to me, I know one of the other things you're passionate about is eliminating bad use of technology. And so you had talked about the fetish, fetish say it for me. Fetishization of technology. Fetishization of technology. <laughs> sure. I knew I was going to stumble on that. Yeah. So what exactly is that for you? How do you define that? So great example, uh, I met a 26 year old woman who had a catastrophic brain injury from an asthma attack and her parents fought really hard to get her home. So she was at home and then they opened the doors to every piece of tech imaginable. So they had Google Home, they had um, uh, TV monitors which had her calendar on it, um, cameras in every room. So they, they mistook, uh, they made the mistake because no one was curating it for them. So they, they confused security with health monitoring. Okay. And there were sensors everywhere. So her parents, um, they haven't slept six hours straight because they get SMSs through the night if she gets up. Oh, no. So that was a clear example of too much tech not related to a decent outcome. Mm -hmm. 
what were the outcomes? Right. Um, if, if so, therefore they were exhausted. So, and watching someone who's had a stroke try and talk to Google Home to turn on a light. It took seven, seven goes to say hello Google because of the speech impediment she's got. So I saw all this tech and went, this isn't helping. This is, this is not helping because it's not improving outcomes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and because it's such a new area, we need more data and some really rigorous research to say that home monitoring, that artificial intelligence leads to a great outcome. And then we should use it. But um, at the moment, uh, we, uh, we, we know that the marketplace is growing and companies are saying, our products are the best, fill your house with all of it. Right. And all, that, all that's doing is just fatiguing us. So that's what I would say that um, is when technology is not serving us and our outcomes. So paint me a picture for the future here. If, if all things work out well, yeah. you know, op, like the most optimistic view you have of how healthcare could look in the next five years, what does that look like? Okay. It's... Um, less about clinicians, more about community. So a little example is we obviously want more people to stay at home rather than go into nursing homes or be hospitalised. So there are karma networks in where I live in Melbourne, called the, something called the Kensington Karma Network. And it's a Facebook group where everyone in the suburb joins. They're not allowed to sell anything, but they must give away things for free and they must help each other solve problems. Mm -hmm. So people make extra muffins and then say, I've got extra muffins, come and get some. Okay. They give stuff away, they look after each other's dogs, they care for each other. So it's a karma network. Because great healthcare is, will not succeed if you go back to a, a crap community and you're isolated. Mm -hmm. If you're socially isolated, you have a 14% increased risk of mortality, morbidity. So reducing social isolation is so important. So uh, in the future, it won't just be the hospitals and the healthcare services. It'll be the community that's engaged to support each other. And then we've got something that's very, very sustainable. And just a brief example, on my street, um, there is an 84-year-old GP, um, general practitioner, and, um, and if he has a fall in the, at night, he calls me and I will get out of my bed, go up three doors and I pick him up and put him back into bed. That's what we've got going on. And it didn't take much. Right. That means an ambulance isn't called and he doesn't go to hospital because he's not in the bed for, uh, d down on the floor for right. so long that there's complications. So that's a karma network working to reduce, reduce health risks for him, but also costs. Mm -hmm. So if we could scale that up and whole suburbs and streets could become caring streets where we look e after each other in regards to our older uh, population, but also in mental health as well. Sure. So that's the future, far more integrated far more integrated with the community taking an active role to support each other to stay healthy. Fantastic. Well, hopefully that vision of the future will come to pass here. And I like um, how focused on people it is, how people-centered it is, as opposed to letting the technology drive it. It's really letting the people make the best use of the technology. Right. Thank you so much for joining Great us job. here. It's lovely to hear your perspective. Thank you so much. This is Jessica DeMassa from the Heise Studio here at HIC 2017. Thank you.